the Sepik Valley in northern Papua New Guinea. A British documentary filmmaker named Johnny Hughes makes his way through a dense tropical wilderness with members of his crew. They're led by a man from a local group known as the Insect Tribe. Hughes has spent years documenting their lifestyle and culture. Today, he watches them build an A-frame hut to replace one that was damaged in a storm. It's set high on stilts with palm fronds for roofing. The Sepik Valley is one of the few areas on Earth where humans still practice something like the nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle of our pre-civilized ancestors. The people here generally don't recognize money or private property. They paddle up and down the Sepik River in dugout canoes. For food, they catch insects, spear crocodiles, and feral pigs, and forage for sago and tropical fruit. Over the course of many months and many fireside discussions, the tribe's people come to appreciate Hughes's curiosity about their culture, and they become more and more curious about his. But when some of them say they'd like to visit the UK, he wonders if it's the right thing to do. What if the culture shock is overwhelming? What if they never want to come home? Still, he agrees to invite them and to film their visit. Back in London, Hughes plans an elaborate cultural exchange. He can't wait to introduce his friends from the rainforest to the bustling streets, his favorite TV shows, and all the latest gadgets. But once they arrive, Hughes finds they're more interested in other things, like his bizarre habit of leaving his house every morning to go to work. They ask him, don't you want to spend your time with your friends and family? Nor are they impressed by the TVs and tablets and other technological marvels. Wouldn't it be more fun to hang out and tell stories? In the end, the only technology the insect people want to bring back to the Sepik Valley is the Brits' clever use of feathers to stabilize their arrows. Johnny Hughes has learned what explorers and anthropologists have been learning and relearning for centuries. When faced with a choice between their way of life and civilization, hunter-gatherers nearly always reject civilization. And that realization leaves Hughes with an uncomfortable sense of envy. Could it be that he's been duped by the trappings of modern life? Hi, I'm Jonathan Fields. Tune into my podcast for conversations about the sweet spot between work, meaning, and joy. And also listen to other people's questions about how to get the most out of that thing we call work. Check out Spart wherever you enjoy podcasts. From Wondery, I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. I founded The Next Big Idea Club with Malcolm Gladwell, Susan Cain, Daniel Pink, and Adam Grant to connect people to some of the boldest thinking shaping our culture and our future. Each week on the podcast, we bring you one idea with the power to change the way you see the world. This week, why civilization makes us miserable. But wait, isn't civilization the centerpiece of human progress? Isn't it the vehicle that brought us art, literature, and technology? Isn't it what delivered us from hunger, disease, and savage violence? Christopher Ryan, author of the bestseller Sex at Dawn and host of the podcast Tangentially Speaking, doesn't think so. In his new book, Civilized to Death, Ryan argues that many of the supposed benefits of civilized life are actually solutions to problems that were caused by civilization in the first place. We celebrate modern medicine, but we rarely consider how unhealthy we are compared to our ancestors. We celebrate progress against poverty and gender inequality without seeing how civilization is often at the root of injustice. We celebrate labor-saving technology, but often without questioning whether the new products actually improve our lives. And as for the incredible abundance of food produced by modern agriculture, for Ryan, that's where all the trouble started. Christopher Ryan, welcome to the Next Big Idea podcast. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so happy to have you on the show, Chris. I've been waiting patiently, unbeknownst to you, for someone to write this book for many years. And of course, you were the perfect person to do so, having written the cult classic Sex at Dawn, which I have shared with many friends. So why don't we start with the 
thesis of your new book, which is uh, Thomas Hobbes famously said, life before the state was nasty, brutish, and short. And your view, I think, is that he had it exactly backwards. Yes, I think he did on every point. And that quotation is sort of cut back from the original, which was life before the state was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And as it turns out, he was wrong on all five of those counts. And um, so, the, yeah, the, the, the argument of civilized to death isn't necessarily that life before the state was better than life after the state. I, I, I'm not saying that civilization has necessarily been a net loss, but that it's an open question. And it's a discussion that is contaminated with uh, incredible amounts of ignorance and bias masquerading as science. Well, I don't think I'll be twisting your arm to encourage you to take a moment to wax rhapsodic about the beauty of the hunter-gatherer experience. And I'll tee you up with one of my favorite quotes from the book. It's a quote about the Paraha, a group of hunter-gatherers, I'm sure I've mispronounced it, in the upper Amazon. That's from linguist Daniel Everett, who lived with them for more than 20 years. He wrote, the Paraha laugh about everything. When someone's hut blows over in a rainstorm, the occupants laugh more loudly than anyone. They laugh when they catch a lot of fish. They laugh when they catch no fish. They laugh when they're full. They laugh when they're hungry. And then you say, the laughter of the Paraha suggests an easy harmony with the world they inhabit, which is the world their minds and bodies expect, because it is essentially the same environment that created them. Can you elaborate? Yeah, I, you know, we're one of possibly the only species that has manipulated our environment to such an extent that we're no longer comfortable in it. It's a strange enigma of civilization that we create the world we live in, but we've created a world that is corrosive to our spirits, that is debilitating to our minds and our bodies that has no space for the sorts of community and relationships that we crave. It's a very strange thing that we've done. Whereas if you look at the, the Pinaha, they live in the world that they are designed to live in. They live in the world that they've evolved to live in. They eat the sorts of foods that their bodies are adapted to. They you know, have the stress levels that their bodies are adapted to. Even if you look at the sort of spirit religious beliefs of people before and after civilization, what you find is that uh, hunter-gatherers view their world as benevolent. They see their gods as giving, nurturing, generous gods, and, and almost always gods, by the way, not a singular god. Hmm. And then with agriculture, you see a, a shift to a single sort of capricious, angry, jealous God. And so I think this represents or reflects a very different understanding of, of our place on the planet and our relationship to the natural world. Is it one of antagonism and fear and struggle, uh, as Hobbes would have it, or you know, most uh, monotheistic religions? Or is it one of integration and nurturing and mutuality? which is what uh, hunter-gatherer uh, spiritual systems generally reflect. Well, and I think part of the misconception that you point out in the book is that our collective perception of what the hunter-gatherer experience was does not reflect the reality. And it wasn't just, I mean, that one quote about this sort of constant laughter and joy in this community was not alone. There was, I think, Christopher Columbus in his diaries talked about the constant laughter and generosity of spirit of the people that he encountered. And I love this observation that Ben Franklin wrote in a letter to a friend. He observed that when an Indian child, this is a quote from Ben Franklin's letter from what, late 1700s, when an Indian child has been brought up among us, taught our language and habituated to our customs, yet if he goes to see his relations and make one Indian ramble, I, I'm curious to know what a ramble is, there is no persuading him ever to return. And in contrast, when white children get a taste of Indian life, they also prefer it and they never want to come back, right? So this has been tested many times in the early years of our 
Western civilized interaction with hunter-gatherer communities, that there was a clear preference on both sides for the forager experience. Yeah, it's it's pretty much universal. I'm not aware of any case of a native person willingly choosing to come and live in the white society or the you know European society, whereas there are hundreds, if not thousands, of documented cases of the opposite, as you indicate. You know, there were laws passed in the colonies to make it illegal to go and live with the Indians. So many people were just you know abandoning white or European society in favor of the foraging society that uh, they had to pass laws to stop it. It's a conundrum. It, it's a strange uh, thing when you look at the history of uh, first contact where the Europeans were so convinced of their superiority and yet the evidence was everywhere that people who'd seen both sides almost always chose the other side. So let's talk a little more specifically about what we know about the hunter-gatherer experience and culture, which is a lot more than probably most people think, right? We've had observations from hundreds and hundreds of cultures around the world. The vast majority of our existence as a species, we have lived as nomadic hunter-gatherers. And you say there are three characteristics that are nearly universal across all of these cultures around the world. They're fiercely egalitarian, they're mobile, and they have a, a shared sense of gratitude. If we could dig in, Chris, just a little bit to each of these, starting with fiercely egalitarian. I find this fascinating. Yeah, egalitarianism is universal among hunter-gatherers. And just to sort of set the stage and make sure everyone understands what we're talking about, we're not saying all non-European people fit this description, right? The Aztecs were a civilization, the Mayans, the Incas, these are all civilizations that, you know, had the same sorts of inequalities and political hierarchies and agriculture and, and all the other uh, problems that we find in agricultural societies. So immediate return hunter-gatherers are people who basically move around in their environment and they eat what they find that day. Yep. They have no refrigeration. They're not smoking salmon, uh, you know, like in the Pacific Northwest. That's a, a different social system. But among immediate return hunter-gatherers, which, as you say, represent well over 95% of our existence as a species, fierce egalitarianism is universal. And what this means is that there are still hierarchies. Uh, we're primates, and virtually all social primates are hierarchical. So if you're the best hunter, you're bringing in meat, that might give you leverage to you know, tell other people what to do. But there are very uh, insistent social mechanisms to keep the hierarchical tendency of the species in check so that no one has coercive power over anyone else. If I sh shot a deer and I bring the deer back to the village and I share that deer only with my wife and my children, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well, first of all, there's no refrigeration. So we're only going to eat a small part of the deer that night and the rest is going to rot. Secondly, what's going to happen to our social interactions when the rest of the group is sitting around starving, uh, hungry, and resentful while I cook up this deer for my wife and my kids? So status comes through generosity mm -hmm. yeah. in these societies. And children are indoctrinated in this approach, uh, that you share everything. And again, this is not a noble savage argument. I'm not saying hunter-gatherers are better people by nature. What I'm saying is that hunter-gatherer society functions through mitigating risk, just like our society does, but they do it in a different way. They do it by distributing risk through generosity and cooperation, and we do it through insurance companies or you know different sort of social mechanisms. Sure. And so in a hunter-gatherer society, your survival depends upon the generosity of the people that you live with. So the three nearly universal characteristics of hunter-gatherers, the first was fiercely egalitarian, the second is, is mobility, and there were these semi-permeable boundaries between groups. Right, yeah. Anthropologists refer to this as fission-fusion social organization, and, and it's, the term is used in biology as well. Um, many primates have this social organization, meaning that seasonally, smaller bands would come together. Because, of course, if you're in a small hunter-gatherer band of 100 people or fewer, 
the vigorous DNA mixing is not going to be happening after a couple of generations. And there's a, a sort of a natural impulse to move out. Humans are what are called female exogamous species, meaning that the females generally leave the group they're born into when they become sexually mature. So what we see are these annual or semi-annual rituals where the smaller groups will come together and then people will sort of move into different bands. So the, the membership in bands is not set, which is another wonderful thing because if social tensions develop between two people, they can leave. There's no problem. It's easy. Go go to your friend's band or your brother's band or, you know, whatever. And the third consistent characteristic is gratitude. Gratitude for a generous environment. And I love this phrase, so many fishies, so many birdies, so many mongongo nuts or whatever it is. Uh, right? I mean, it's a perception yeah. of, of a world of abundance versus a world of scarcity. And the irony is that the world can feel more abundant when you have nothing than when you have all sorts of assets. One of the most important essays, in my opinion, that's ever been written in anthropology is called The Original Affluent Society by Marshall Salins. Uh, I think he wrote it in the late 60s. And basically what he argued is that poverty is a creation of agriculture. Poverty is an expression of inequality. So when everyone has the same and whatever resources are available flow freely within a social group, there is no poverty because no one has less than anyone else. And as you suggested, hunter-gatherers view the world in terms of abundance, which makes perfect sense, right? If, you know, you or I look at a jungle, we see chaos and confusion, and we don't know what those plants are. We don't know what's dangerous, what's edible. When someone who who has lived in that environment their entire lives and their father and their grandfather and everyone has lived in that environment. They look at that same jungle and they see, you know, a Costco, they see uh, sure. resources everywhere. They see medicines, mm -hmm. they see foods, they see uh, tools, they see shelter, they see everything they need is right there. Yeah, yeah. And they know exactly how to use it, how to get it. And it's all free. So they look at the world, you know, the way you or I might, if we had a, black visa card that we could just charge up whatever we wanted and never have to pay a bill. So they're incredibly affluent. And then when Europeans would come and try to convince them that they need to farm, they need to work 10 hours every day, scratching at the earth, you know, hoping that something will grow and watering it and pulling weeds and worrying about pests. Universally, they say, I, why? Why do you live this way? It makes no sense. I love your observation. This is one of my favorite metaphors in the book. We've not only domesticated other animals and put them in zoos that are usually poor simulations of their natural habitats, but we've also done this to ourselves. We're living in an artificial environment of our own making, and our unhappiness is directly correlated with the degree to which our current environment is different from the environment in which we evolved. Yeah, yeah, I think that's important to understand. And the problem is that people think they know how horrible that environment was because people don't understand that that starting with Hobbes right through today, they're being fed misinformation about where we came from in order to make the current world seem better than it is, in order to make you feel grateful that you have antibacterial wipes or whatever it is at the moment that's saving our lives. People don't understand that most of the benefits of civilization are actually partial remedies for problems that didn't exist until civilization. Mm -hmm. So this sort of more accurate and balanced cost-benefit analysis of civilization, I think, is really crucial right now. It's hard to argue with a call for better accounting. Not that it's an easy task with a topic as broad as civilization itself. And we modern humans are hardly unbiased observers. We're so immersed in the language, the behaviors, the very atmosphere of civilization that it's difficult to imagine anything else. But Christopher Ryan says the rethinking is starting to happen, sometimes in unexpected places. The Anxious Achiever is the podcast about your mental health and your work. 
where leaders from top companies, entrepreneurs, athletes, celebrities, and leading experts share how they've managed through anxiety, depression, and other mental health challenges, and how they've become better leaders in the process. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll feel seen, and you'll learn great tools and skills. And I guarantee you're going to look at leadership in a new way. Come find out why we won the Mental Health America 2023 Media Award. Get the Anxious Achiever wherever you find your podcasts. As Christopher Ryan points out, civilization definitely has its downsides. One upside, it allows for vibrant online communities like the Next Big Idea Club. And we'd love for you to be a part of it. Join us for three months for free and we'll give you access to the most life-changing new nonfiction, along with audio and video highlights from the authors, so you can absorb the key ideas in just minutes. Now, that's something that wasn't available in our ancestral environment. Check out the oh-so-civilized conversation we're having at nextbigideaclub.com slash podcast. It's the summer of 1971, and Lauren Cordain is working as a lifeguard at a beach on Lake Tahoe. Cordain is a track star at the University of Nevada, and he's developed a keen interest in nutrition science, just as people around the country are starting to pay attention to health and fitness. Hello, I'm doing a series of interviews on nutrition. Do you know the four basic food groups? Uh, no, not really. What do you get from these food groups? <laughs> what do you mean, what do I get? Things well, like uh, protein, the things like iron, and things uh, like nutrients. Oh, minerals. Uh, They're called nutrients. Okay, yeah. With the new interest in nutrition comes a series of trendy new diets. Cordain and his lifeguard friends compare notes as they experiment with veganism, fasting, vitamin supplements, and other approaches. But as an aspiring scientist, Cordain wants to move beyond trial and error. What's the end goal of a dieting strategy? Is it to lose weight, to improve athletic performance, to cut down on heart attacks and strokes? He's worried that he and his friends are conflating variables. More than that, he's worried about the lack of an overarching theory for why a given diet should work. Jump ahead 16 years. Cordain is a professor of health and exercise science at the University of Colorado when he stumbles on a paper called Paleolithic Nutrition by S. Boyd Eaton. Most of the genes involved in basic cellular processes are ancient and fundamental. Their expression seems to have remained consistent across the primate lineage for 70 million years. Eaton makes a simple observation. Humans evolved before we started to farm. But instead of eating the plants and animals we grew up with as a species, we mostly eat the products of agriculture. The modern Western diet clashes with the natural evolution of human nutrition. Cordain thinks back to his days as a lifeguard. It seems Eaton has found the connection between looking good, feeling good, and performing well. He's also found an overarching theory for why it all makes sense. In 2002, Cordain publishes a manifesto, The Paleo Diet, which sells 100,000 copies. Here he is in 2012. All of the processed foods that we eat now come from four major food groups, cereal grains, dairy products, vegetable oils, and refined sugars. And so what we try to do is eliminate or uh, severely reduce those foods and focus on real living foods like fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, uh, nuts and seeds, and grass-produced meats. Uh, seafood and, and fish are really the foundation of this diet. The concept behind the paleo diet lines up neatly with Christopher Ryan's thesis in Civilized to Death. And just like the diet, Ryan's ideas have attracted attention, but they still haven't quite convinced the heavyweights. There has been this emerging view that agriculture was a Faustian bargain, that for most humans, for a very sustained period of time, the impact of the agricultural revolution was a profoundly negative for a large portion of Homo sapiens. Harari's made this case in Sapiens, which is, you know, has sold millions and millions of copies. Jared Diamond, I think, in the world until yesterday. And so in that sense, I think there is a mounting consensus. On the other hand, you're clearly running afoul in this book of the thesis of Steven Pinker and Matt Ridley in their recent books. And of course, they're these major intellectual heavyweights whose books are lauded. Do you think there's a kind of cultural resistance to your thesis? 
Of course there is. People always are going to be happier to hear good news than bad news, right? And if you tell people that they live in the best possible time, that this is the the greatest moment you could have possibly been born, they love to hear that. Who doesn't? So I think that there is a lot of energy behind arguments uh, that applaud the modern world, that sort of scoff at people like me who say, wait a minute, there's been a big cost for this. You know, is it really worth that cost? I think even raising the question is, you know, verges on uh, offensive or taboo for a lot mm-hmm. of people. Heresy. Yeah, it's it's heresy. I mean, and it always is, right? To To question the values of one's own community. Most people aren't ready to do that. On the other hand, I think both Steven Pinker and Matt Ridley would probably say that they were flying in the face of a kind of perennial apocalyptic sensibility that humans tend to have, that like the sky is always falling. And that I think to some degree, they may have, certainly in the case of Steven Pinker, may have paid some kind of reputational dues for taking a kind of optimistic perspective. I mean, I would make the counter argument that the view that we are destroying the planet and destroying ourselves and that the end is nigh that I think there's a a relatively strong appetite for that message. Yeah, I think you're right. Although I think it's quite recent. I think things have to get really, really bad before people are willing to to look at that, uh, at least on a massive scale. I think there are always people who are personally oriented toward an apocalyptic view. But I think, you know, in general, societies, institutions of any sort are self-perpetuating and they encourage ideas and expressions that celebrate that society. I think Steven Pinker, Matt Ridley, to some extent, Richard Dawkins, a lot of their work is predicated upon a neo-Hobbesian view of the natural world, where it's a place of cruelty and chaos and destruction. And we're very lucky to be behind our protective walls and that the way things are going is the right way. It's the way it should be going. But I think to a large extent, they're blind to their own biases, as am I, sure, right? As, sure. as is everyone. But, you know, Matt Ridley, for example, wrote The uh, Rational Optimist. Yeah. And, you know, Matt Ridley was raised in a castle, literally <laughs> raised in a castle. Yeah. Right. He's a hereditary member of the House of Lords. Yeah. I mean, if if, yeah. if ever there were someone who's indoctrinated into a certain class consciousness, uh, it's Matt Ridley. He was the head of a bank, for God's sake. And so, of course, it's working well for him. Right. From his perspective. And I think this happens so often when people look at the world, they only see their world. Right. They don't see the people digging through the dump in Manila. Sure. I think what Matt Ridley might say from his castle in response is he is he might say if he'd done his research he might say well Christopher Ryan was um, in his childhood obsessed with Indians with Native Americans and was coming home from school and putting on a moccasins and a loincloth and he's carrying out this kind of sixties fantasy that's idealizing the way things were. No doubt, I've I, and you know you've heard that because I've talked about it publicly. It's it's true. I grew up, you know, I was a kid for the first Earth Day. Hippies were dressing up in buckskins and returning to the land when I was a kid. So definitely there was a a cultural milieu that I was growing up in that oriented me toward this perspective. You know, and as I say, I, I have my own biases for sure. But I do think that the argument I'm putting forth is solid and the research on hunter gatherers is solid. And so... Okay, Matt Ridley grew up in a castle. I grew up thinking I was an Indian. But let's look at you know the solidity of the arguments he puts forth right. and the solidity of whatever I've put forth and, and other people. I think that's where the debate has to take place. That's right. And just because your prior biases and experiences predispose you to sort of perhaps want this to be the strongest argument. It doesn't mean that it's not the strongest argument. And I think the book is incredibly effective at making this case. I have an explanation for why the ideas in this book are resisted that's a little bit different from yours, although I'm sure you've thought of this. And to speak more broadly about it, like you've obviously got what I think of as a real kind of cult classic in Sex at Dawn. Your podcast, Tangentially Speaking, is highly popular. You've got a big and growing following. And I think this book will reach a large audience. 
but it was not reviewed by the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and all the other major publications that Pinker's and Ridley's books were reviewed by, right? And that may be partly because it's perceived to be heterodox or flying in the face of the prevailing views. My guess is this comes down to a perception a lot of intellectuals have that evolutionary psychology is dangerous. And I see this because I've, I've been interested in this field for many, many years, and I see eyes roll as soon as a sort of Evo psych argument emerges. And I think it comes from this kind of fear that, oh gosh, if we say that the behavior of our ancestors is somehow indicative and tightly correlated with our current yearnings and proclivities, that might have the effect of justifying all sorts of untoward antisocial behavior. And the irony is that your argument is the exact opposite, right? That if we look back in our past, we find more of the behavior we want from ourselves. It is a complicated space I'm occupying because I, I do use evolutionary arguments, and yet I'm using them to dispute the mainstream evolutionary psychological views that our ancestors were brutal, were sexually possessive and jealous, that women were subordinate to men and so on. But the problem is those things are not human nature. Those things are results of agriculture. Women lost virtually all of their autonomy and social status with the advent of agriculture. If you look at hunter-gatherer groups, women are respected members of those groups. They bring in more of the calories mm, yep. per day than men do. So they're much more essential to life and they have power that is commensurate with that um, importance. What appeals to me about evolutionary psychology is that there's an admirable humility in it. It reminds me of the argument that I took away from Michael Pollan's book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, which I remember as follows. Human nutrition is incredibly complex. Some years ago, we discovered vitamins and we thought, oh, well, now we understand human nutrition. We, we all need to take vitamin supplements, right? Then we learned about antioxidants. Then we learned about the microbiome. And effectively, Pollan says, we should accept that we are just beginning to understand the enormous complexity of the science of what nourishes a human body. What we do know is that we co-evolved with these plants for millions of years. And so what we can have some confidence in is that eating the plants, if they're grown in, in a sort of natural environment, is a pretty good bet. But we need to be more humble in our sort of confidence about what we actually know about human nutrition. And I see you as making this argument for human happiness to some degree, right? Which is like, we humans are extremely complex. We can't be overly haughty in our what we profess to understand about ourselves. But by gosh, looking back at where we've come from is a very useful exercise. Exactly. And you know that humility extends to the point where you say, we don't really need to understand on a molecular level why this or that works. We know it does. And the reason we know it does is you go to the Pinaha and you see people laughing and healthy bodies, no diabetes, no cancer, no heart problems. That tells us something. We might not understand why. You know, how does their diet or their activity level or their stress level, how does that interact with the body? And, and you know, that's worth studying and people are studying it. But what we know is it works. And that gives us a map toward happiness where we can navigate our way to meaningful lives, to satisfying lives, to uh, healthier lives. Paleo nutrition, paleo medicine, all this paleo craze is coming about because people are recognizing that you can't go forward without knowing where you've come from. The natural way of doing things works for a reason. It's worked for a long, long time in ways we can't begin to comprehend. The natural way may indeed work, but Christopher Ryan cautions us not to read civilized to death as a romantic back to nature argument. He says we pass the point of no return in our relationship with civilization, but he also warns against just giving up. So what can we actually do? Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from the leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. 
Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z General Partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in citro CEO, Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. At least to me, Christopher Ryan's Civilized to Death reads like a call to personal action. After all, who wants to live under conditions that clash so profoundly with our species' evolution? Ryan says it's not as simple as just going back to the good old days. But there are some things we can do. Let's talk about how we can apply the learnings from our forager ancestors to live better lives today. Like one of the things that I found most resonant was a statistic that 25% of Americans live alone. And this has struck me throughout my life as one of the kind of really poorly thought out aspects of our modern lives is everybody living in white boxes, isolated from each other, which becomes particularly challenging when you're trying to raise children or in your later years. And uh, it, it just seems like a very poor way to organize people. Yeah, I agree. I, one of the facts that I came across in the research for this book that really stuck with me is that the number one most important factor in terms of how long you'll live and how satisfied you'll be with your life is whether or not you consider yourself to be embedded in a community of uh, loving, respectful people. If you feel that way, it's about 10 year uh, addition to your longevity from that single factor. Much more important uh, statistically than whether you smoke or what your body weight is or your exercise regimen, all the rest of it, you're much more likely to benefit from feeling embedded in this community of loving people. You know, we're taught to believe that we should all have our own possessions where we're in this scarcity-based society, and we're taught to believe that there's never enough and you always have to you know, save up for a rainy day. But in fact, the best way to anticipate and, and protect yourself against problems is to surround yourself with friends, to take care of them so that they'll take care of you when you need it. Yeah, I, I spent 10 summers as a child and later an adolescent and early adult working at a summer camp in Vermont. And when I think back on it, and they were some of the most magical summers of my life, and when I think back on it, it really replicated beautifully this notion of 150 people living in huts around a campfire. And first of all, the access to I mean, a kind of communal parenting dynamic, where as a young boy, you could look around and see 20, 30, 40 examples of what it meant to be a young adult. Mm -hmm. And there yeah. was that just the spilling, overflowing laughter and, and here we were living in canvas tents with no electricity, right? It does strike me that we're going to need to try to figure out how to reorganize our cohabitation to some degree. As you point out, like if you're a parent with young children, that's an exhausting, exhausting experience, very isolating, very challenging, as much as we'd like sort of to believe in the hallmark version of what it's like to be a young parent. On the other hand, there are lots of people who don't have kids and would love to spend time with those children, right? So, so there's actually a sense of loss on both sides. Three sides, because the children suffer as well, right? Exactly, you know, your exactly right. Your description yeah. of summer camp, it, it's why is summer camp so attractive and why do so many people remember it as being so wonderful? As you say, there are many examples of adults around uh, that you can look to, but also at most summer camps, you have mixed ages. So no one is more an expert on life to a 12-year-old than a 14-year-old, right? That's right. And that's also part of the, the natural educational context of our species, of not only a bunch of kids in a room with one adult, but a bunch of kids in a, in a place with lots of different kids of different ages. So it's a much more natural way to learn how life works. And your comment about parents, I think, is so important because parenting is an example of the kind of unnecessary 
shame and suffering that that I'm trying to address in these books, that it's an unnatural situation that parents are thrust into. And they're told that it is natural. They're told to believe that, that, you know, you should be able to do all this. You should be able to raise these kids on your own while you're doing everything else in life. And that's just not the case. That's not the way our species has raised children for millennia. That's a very recent demand on parents. And it's not at all surprising that they're suffering greatly from it. So as we think about how we can do things better, the subject of work is a very interesting one in your book. You cite a 2013 Gallup poll that says 70% of Americans hate their jobs or have simply checked out. Meanwhile, in contrast, hunter-gatherers had no concept of toil, you say, right? And, And partly because their work was varied, it required skill and intelligence. There was not very much of it, right? They didn't, I mean, this is a, a misunderstanding, right? They didn't work as hard as we think. It was done with friends and it was optional. Do you think there's something we can learn from this approach? Yeah, I I think our understanding of work is a great reflection of of the whole issue we're talking about with the hunter-gatherer life versus civilized life. You know, the studies of of hunter-gatherer work generally conclude that they work anywhere from 12 to 16 hours a week. So what counts as work? Well, you know, gathering food, hunting, putting up a a shelter, a temporary shelter, building the fire, cooking the food, and so on. Now, these are the things that we do when we're on vacation, Yep. right? We go hunting, we go fishing, we put up a tent. Yeah, we we tend to our gardens, our vegetable gardens. Yeah, (laughs) exactly, exactly. So even the 12 to 16 hours a week that hunter-gatherers are, quote, working, they're actually doing things that we consider to be pleasurable uh, play. And the reason we consider those things to be pleasurable is the same reason we love sitting around a campfire, right? That's where we came from. Those are the things that we have done forever. So the concept of work being something you do in order to support yourself, even though you hate doing it, that's totally alien to hunter-gatherers. So yes, I think this idea of the dignity in work and there's something necessary about going in and putting in your hours in a factory or a coal mine or something like that is uh, literally inhuman. So Chris, you end the book talking about peer networks and you quote Stephen Johnson, who happens to be a friend that I, I sent him your excerpts and he was delighted. But peer networks like Kickstarter, and as you know, we recently had Yancey Strickler on the show you say, are scaled up modern reflections of the social networks in which our ancestors lived for hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, I I think that they are reflections of a lot of the social dynamics that allowed our ancestors to survive, the sort of mutual dependence, the cooperation, the coming together with a common goal, sort of a non-hierarchical, bottom-up information processing you know, one of the benefits of the modern world is that technology is allowing us to connect with people that we may not be able to connect with in the physical world. And that's resulting in some amazing collaborative opportunities, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, including podcasts. I think podcasts are probably historically as significant as the printing press. Interesting. Uh, It's allowing us to speak with one another and our audience directly. You know, I have someone on my podcast, we talk about whatever we want, mm-hmm. um, and hit a few buttons and 100,000 people are listening the next day. It's just amazing and unprecedented. Well, Chris, I think the cultural timing of this book is quite good because we've been, you know, here at the Next Big Idea Club, we have the great pleasure of reading a lot of books. And of course, we see commonalities and trend lines that I'm sure you see as a, as a reader. And there's been a lot of emerging lately about the negative impact of isolation, the loneliness epidemic, as the former Surgeon General calls it, the health benefits of walking on trails, being in nature, right? We've learned that acts of generosity make people happier. There's been a lot of focus in the last decade or so on on the importance of mindfulness, being present, living in the moment. What's fascinating to me about Civilized to Death is it offers a kind of unified field theory of human happiness to some degree, right? That all these discoveries about what makes people happy 
makes total rational sense when you look at it through the lens of the environment in which we evolved. Can I use that line? That was fantastic. (laughs) (laughs) A unified field theory of human happiness. I wish I had written that. Thank you for that. And and I'm honored to be among your guests. You've had amazing guests on this program, and it's a real honor to be one of them. I I agree with you. I I think that that's really what I'm trying to do, uh, both with Sex at Dawn and Civilized to Death, is to give people a more accurate understanding of what a human being is and why, uh, where we came from. And um, once you understand that, then it does give you uh, a universal tool to think for yourself about what's going to make you happy and, and to understand why certain things that our society tells us will make us happy actually don't. The bigger car, the bigger house, the bigger bank account, more fame, more, 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 more. It doesn't work. And I agree with you that we're at a unique historical moment where I think more people than ever before are looking at our sort of accepted wisdom as to what a good life is. And they're saying, I don't think so. And maybe one of the reasons that more people are willing to question it is that eternal growth has exposed itself as empty and exploitative and destructive. The American dream is not accessible to people who are getting out of college now with $50,000 in debt and Uh, no good job prospects. And they're looking around and saying, you know, I can't do it the way this society is telling me to do it. I need to rethink this. I need to consider other options. And from my perspective, the best way to figure out what's going to make a human being happy is to understand what a human being is and where we evolved. So yeah, I, I look at the possibilities now And I I see so much opportunity to create a world in which we would actually be happy and fulfilled and live meaningful lives, you know, by incorporating the information that we gain by looking at our species in its natural world. You quote this wonderful line from T.S. Eliot, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to return from where we began and know the place for the first time. And so maybe all this sort of post-agricultural wanderings and different experiments and types of structures for human society that will, in, in future decades and centuries, be able to take those adventures and mishaps and use them to come back home. Yeah, that's uh, my wish for our species. It'll be better for us and, and for every other species on the planet if, if we can accomplish that. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for taking time to be with us today. It's such a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Rufus. I, I really appreciate the, the thoughtfulness and depth of your questions. It's unusual and, and very gratifying for a writer to engage with someone who's really, really focused as you are. From Wondery... This is the next big idea. If you have thoughts about Civilized to Death or other books we discuss in this podcast, and I know you do, we'd love you to join the conversation with me, Christopher Ryan, and other leading thinkers at the Next Big Idea Club. Join now for three months free at nextbigideaclub.com slash podcast. A special thanks today to Christopher Ryan. His book, Civilized to Death, is available wherever books are sold. I'm your host, Rufus Griscom. This episode was written by Eamon Doyle. Caleb Bissinger is our associate producer. Our series producer is Michael Kovnat. Senior producer is Jonathan Miller. Sound designed by Jake Gorski. And executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.